going to give it one more minute here, see if some more people join us and take attendance. There it is. Okay. All right. Let's get into it. Good morning, everybody. Happy Monday. I hope you guys had a nice weekend. Um, for some folks, it might have been a celebratory weekend. For others, it might have been a, more of a sad weekend, depending on which side of the election line you fall. But for anyone, um, it was a good day for democracy, and we had more people turn out for votes than ever have before, which is pretty cool. So uh, those of you who participated in the process, um, thank you for being a good patriot and a good American and, and letting your voice be heard. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about scars and tattoos to start, and then we'll work on a, the quiz for chapters one through three together. You can do it alone if you're watching this later, but um, I want you to be able to talk out ideas and, and clarify confusions because this book can be quite confusing at times. And then depending on time, we'll have a little bit of, of a conversation at the end to try to put some of these pieces together and clarify confusions. So to the start today, I wanna to talk about scars and tattoos, right? If you did your work from last class, you um, read about the slave trade in the article and you saw some images of um, what it looked like when a slave had been beaten, particularly with you know trees and, and sticks and reeds and things like that. Um, and they tend to form these big scars. Seth has got a giant scar on her back that looks like a choke cherry tree. Um, and so I think it's important to recognize that scars are really significant in our lives and in our understanding of our experience. And they're very closely aligned to tattoos. So to start today, you're gonna to type in the chat your response to any one of these questions. If you wanna answer all three, I'd love that. Um, but first of all, why are scars and tattoos significant? Why are they important to people? Why do they matter? What do these two things have in common? Or maybe what do they don't have in common? And then lastly, do you have a specific scar or tattoo that is most meaningful for you? And you might have a lot of scars. You might have a lot of tattoos. Um, so try to zone in on a specific one that is particularly impactful. So for example, I had a friend growing up, her name was Megan. And when she was a baby, she had a lot of heart problems. And so they had to put a what's called a shunt in her chest, in her heart cavity when she was a baby. And she has this giant scar on her chest. And she would always like be proud of it. Like it, this was a proud scar because that scar, you know, essentially saved her life. Um, so if you have a specific scar or tattoo that's meaningful to you, you can share that and what it's about. Um, but I would not, I want everybody to share in the chat or to speak up um, your thoughts to one of these questions. <laughs> Pardon me, I have a tickle this morning in my throat. You can type in the chat, speak. Benjamin says that permanent marks on your skin for things in common. Yeah, they're both permanent marks on your skin. That's an interesting idea, right? That they're permanent. You know, why, does, why do people want to get something like a tattoo that's so permanent? And what makes the permanence of a scar hard to deal with or maybe easier you know what makes that experience particular because it's so permanent um, omar said a scar is a visual representation of who you were or belong to during that time absolutely and, and then i get i think tattoos can be the same omar right and that's why pe people get them is because you might not have a scar from a moment that mattered to you but you essentially create one so that you remember that moment and what it taught you Kenny said, I feel like scars and tattoos signify what people went through or who they are. So if people have scars, they couldn't have uh, went through health problems or went through problems that involved abuse, tattoos, and I would say it shows 
who they are and how it characterizes them. Yeah, so tattoos are more of a choice, right? Well, in some cases not. In cases like the Holocaust, um, they were forcefully tattooed. So sometimes tattoos aren't by choice. But when we choose to have them there, we're trying to identify, right? We're trying to define ourselves to a certain degree. And in much the same way, scars define us. The stories that are behind our scars are defining stories for um, who we are, what we've been through, what might matter to us. Um, Garrett said his specific tattoo, he wanted to honor where he came from and what he loves. Absolutely. Aaron says, I think scars or tattoos can be a reminder about good or bad things that can happen in your life. Yes, good or bad, right, Aaron? Like sometimes scars, oftentimes scars are bad, but sometimes they're good. Sometimes tattoos are, most of the time they're good, but sometimes they're not good, especially if you get one of like, you know, your girlfriend's name and a heart and then you break up and now you have this tattoo on your arm. So I like that you address the, you know, both the positive and negative side of it. Omar said, scars hold a story to them that could have made you a better person, while tattoos said something about you and what you want to show people. So for Omar, it's almost about like what you're showing others. Anna says, a scar that is meaningful for me is one on my knee because it reminds me of the day that I spent with my late grandma. Love that. I think that's really, really cool. Oliver has a scar on her knee, you know, Oliver, yeah, has a scar on her knee that looks like a marker on the skin. She got it when she was about three or four. And it reminds her of when she was young and had no worries in the world. Oh my God, Oliver, I wish we didn't have worries as well. At least the ones we have today. Uh, Robert, a specific scar that I have is on my back of your Achilles. You tore your Achilles, Robert. I am definitely afraid of that happening to me. I think I have nightmares about it. I hear it's like the most painful thing that could ever occur to a person. I'm so sorry that happened to you. I hope you learned something from it. Um, Jackie says tattoos can often cause more scars. So getting a tattoo or covering up your scar only makes it worse. I like that you said that, Jackie. So covering up your scar only makes it worse, right? Like there's something about being willing to show our scars and to unapologetically let the world see them without fear of what they will think of them or what it will mean about us. Um, Consider these ideas of scars as we keep going, connecting them back to some of this other stuff we've looked at and how you might have a, a new understanding of the text. All right, cool. So the new normal, um, you guys are here. So you're obviously getting it. Zoom attendance for today. We will start a quiz in class. You can finish it and submit it today if you want. However, you do not have to submit anything until Thursday or Friday if you're watching this tomorrow um, because that is when your submissions are due. So if you need a couple more days to finish it up, you're good to go, you have the time and space. I have office hours every afternoon, essentially, or anytime you need me. Um, but basically from like 12 to three on most days, my Zoom link will be open um, for you to access and ask questions and get whatever you need, okay? All right, so a couple of reminder things here. This stuff is still kind of going on for some of you. There's a lot of people who haven't completed quizzes on Doll's House and in the Blood. Um, there are some people who still need to do the Socratic and Parlay discussion, uh, and then some people are still doing their IAs. So if you haven't done your IA yet, keep working on it, keep practicing. I have reached out to everybody who's going this week. Please email me back and let me know if you need any of the things I asked you about. Um, if you are having printouts, uh, bullet lists, or 40 line sets printed for your IA, you can pick those up from the Westie Main entrance on Tuesday at 12 p.m. Um, so make sure you're sticking up on your stuff, uh, staying on track, asking questions when you feel stuck, all that good stuff. Quick reminder about scores. As you complete your IA, you will see your score pop up on Empower. Um, on Empower, I've identified your CBS score for each criteria. And then additionally, I've put in the feedback, the, the evaluator comments I wrote on the IB website, and then the particular IB score you got for each criteria. You need a score of 20 out of 40 to pass the individual IA assessment. Now, there's gonna be some people who don't get a 20. I don't want you feeling discouraged, especially, I mean, it's, it's, it's an annoying feeling to get a 19 and be like, oh, I'm so close. Um, so don't get discouraged, don't get frustrated. You can bomb this test and still get a passing composite score of all three assessments together. Your next two are, are weighted worth way more. They're both weighted worth four. 40%. So this is not going to heavily hurt you. If you did not get 
this test down to a 20, you will have an opportunity to still pass IB um, for college credit, okay? Don't be overwhelmed by that. Um, perfect, so we're gonna do a little quiz here. Uh, this is gonna be on Empower. You're gonna head over to Empower and open it, but don't start it yet. We're gonna do it in pieces. We're gonna do the first four questions together as a class. I will then send you into breakout sessions. You'll do questions five through 10 with a group, and then you'll complete questions 11, 13 through 13 on your own. So go ahead and open up the quiz on Empower called B colon one through three. And um, please give me a reaction or a thumbs up or type in the chat or say so when you're ready with the quiz open in front of you on question number one. Oh, thank you, Anna. I was waiting to unlock it per class. Let me get to period two, one second. Thank you, thank you, thank you. No. Do you guys ever have moments where you just, you just hate empower? <laughs> I'm having one right now. <laughs> Kenny's with me. Kenny's with me. All right, you should be good to go. You might need to refresh your page, but it's unlocked now. <laughs> Agreed, Benjamin. All right, so let me know when you've got it open and you're ready to roll with a reaction or a thumbs up or something in the chat or just holler out. Thank you, Erin. Yes, Fern, Fern, it's on Empower under the Beloved playlist. You'll see it's called B um, one through three. Thank you, Estefania. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you, Omar. Thank you, Omar. Thank you, Oliver. Thanks, Robert. Thank you, Anna. I think we're pretty much there. Thanks, Joanna. Thanks, Garrett. Yeah, looks like most of us are ready. If you're still trying to catch up, just uh, do so. Ready as I am, ready to eat spaghetti. I don't really like spaghetti either, Benjamin. It was always my brother's like favorite meal my mom would make and I hated it. It drove me crazy. I'm sorry, that was a side note. Okay, into the quiz. Question number one. What does the word beloved mean? Please type it in the, the class chat first before you type it in your test. Uh, what does the word beloved mean in your own words? Try to come up with a definition that isn't necessarily the direct one we talked about in class, but something in your own words. Nice, Benjamin, yes. Yes, Kenny, correct. Yes, Estefania, feel free to talk to. You don't have to just write in the chat. Yes, Erin. Yep, good, Garrett. So part of the trick here is like, right, finding those other words you would use to describe the same thing. Cool, awesome, looks good. Add it to your Empower quiz if you haven't already and go ahead and move on to question two. Okay, speaking of the word beloved, um, Setha only gets beloved engraved on the tombstone instead of dearly beloved, which is what she really wanted. Why didn't she get the word dearly engraved too? What happened there? Why didn't she get the word dearly engraved too? Please type in the chat your answer or you can go ahead and just speak about it. because beloved means dearly loved right so what that's what's cool about that word omar is because 
it it essentially holds the same idea. Dearly beloved is almost like saying dearly, dearly loved, right? So she knew that the word beloved would encompass what she needed, what mattered to her when it came to this baby. Um, absolutely. So the deeper meaning is that, right? But there is a bit more specific reason why she didn't get the words dearly. What happened there? How did she pay for the engraving on the tombstone? How did she pay for the engraving on the tombstone? No one? No one? Yes, Jackie, she gave up her body. Yes, Anna, she said, if the man could do it in 10 minutes, it was free, right? So she had no money. Um, you know, she was a, a recently freed slave. Uh, therefore, she literally had nothing to her name. So in order to get an engravement on her daughter's tombstone, she had to sell her own body, right? Like Jackie said, she had to give up her body. And he said that for 10 minutes, she could get seven letters. So the only reason she got the word beloved is because she only could get seven letters for 10 minutes. That was the deal. And, and if you look back at that moment and at that scene, she, um, she actually feels guilt because she's like, you know, maybe if I just would have put up with it a little longer and, and gone another five minutes or another 10, could I have gotten the word dearly? No, she feels guilt that she didn't give more of her body in order to have something that truly honored her daughter. Uh, so that's, that's kind of a, that's a, that's a hard ground to exist in if you're Setha, right? That struggle between, you know, giving up yourself, your own self-worth um, in order to honor your daughter and then feeling the guilt because you felt like you couldn't give it enough um, when, when you have nothing to give, right? So it's a pretty tough moment though for her. Um, but essentially she couldn't afford it. She only had seven minutes, 10 minutes for seven letters. All right, moving on to question number three. Identify which details below are part of the tribulations Setha experienced at Sweet Home. There could be more than one answer. Which of these four experiences happened at Sweet Home? The death of baby Suggs, Setha was raped and her milk stolen, boys were hanging from the sycamores, Paul D scares the ghost baby out of the house. Which items occurred at Sweet Home? Go ahead and type which letter you're picking in the answer in the chat box, and then you can answer it on your own quiz as well. Question number three, which tribulation occurred at Sweet Home? Once you have an answer, type it in the chat. Keep in mind, there might be more than one correct answer. Got an answer from Oliver, an answer from Omar, an answer from Aaron, answer from Jackie. Awesome, Anna. Awesome, Benjamin. Fantastic. So far, everybody has been right. Uh, the person who is most right, though, are the ones who said B and C. Okay, B and C are your most correct answers. Um, all four of these events do, do occur in the book. However, B and C are what happens at Sweet Home on the plantation, the death of baby Suggs and the return of Paul D and him scaring the ghost baby out of the house occur back in Ohio after slavery, after she's a freed slave. Uh, perfect, nice job everybody. We will do one more together here as a class question number four. The question is, Why is there a tree on Setha's back? Why is there a tree on Setha's back? So go ahead and type your answer into your Empower quiz. And I would like maybe somebody to share out verbally their thoughts on this particular question. Why is there a tree on Setha's back? Any brave souls talk about Seth's tree this morning? All 
Okay, you can type in the chat. Nobody has to talk. But why is there a tree on Seth's back? What is it? Is there a real tree? Does she have like a tree like this sitting on her back? What's going on here? Benjamin, wasn't it due to the teacher using her like an animal? Yeah, absolutely. It was. Yes, Garrett, it's a bunch of scars. It is a scar, Kenny, and it's like branches, right? Like Robert's saying. So um, I actually have one on my back. I should show you. It probably you know, looks. So it's, it's a bunch of, I don't know if you've ever heard of the term keloid, um, but a keloid is, is what happens when you scar. I tend to get them, actually. I was hoping I could find one for you. But if you scar and the skin sort of like um, puffs up a little bit um, and there's a little bit of um, like, inflamed skin that creates this sort of look. So that is like all over her back. And that happens because they would beat the slaves with sticks and reeds and they call them even um, switches. And so, I mean, this is a soft branch here, but imagine like if this was a big old stick branch from a tree, a big branch, they would use these to do the lashings and the whippings, right? And so uh, oftentimes what they would use were rough, hard, pokey, spiky surfaces that would break the skin really rough because they would also do it repetitively. So it would increasingly break more wounded skin open and it would create these, these crazy looking structures of scars. All right, now it's, who tells her that it looks like a tree? Does anybody remember? That wasn't her idea. She takes it on is like, I got a tree on my back, but she wasn't the first one to think of that. Who tells her that she has a tree on her back? She, yes, Paul D does um, mention the tree, but Robert, that's after she says, I have a tree on my back. And then once they have the romantic moment, Paul D's thinking about it and he's like, that's no tree, right? So it probably doesn't actually look like a tree necessarily, um, but someone referenced it to look like a tree. And yes, Oliver, you're right. It's the, it's the white girl who helps her when she is escaping sweet home, right? And she's pregnant and she is in need of help. And this white girl comes out of the bushes and offers up compassion and care for Setha, which is something that most white people have never, ever shown her. Um, she rubs and washes her feet. She takes care of her. She helps her deliver the baby eventually. And when she sees Setha's back, she says, oh, you got a choke cherry tree on your back. And so I think in this moment, Setha was able to see her own scars, her own pain, her own trauma as something maybe a bit more beautiful than that. I don't know if she's fully owned it, but um, you know, she loved the idea of, of that being described as a choke cherry tree. So we'll look at that symbolism in the future here, particularly with choke cherry trees and what that might represent in Setha's world. Um, so what's going to happen now is you're going to move into breakout rooms. I will put you in there for 10 minutes. When you get in there, you have two tasks. The first one is you're going to do a round robin check-in. So each person in the group will identify something that they do understand about the text. This could be any detail, any big idea, any character or setting or plot event. What is something you do understand? And then follow that up with something that you don't understand. They could have connection, they could have to do with each other or be completely separate ideas. Um, and then as a group, try to make sense of their confusion. Um, see if you can clarify it or um, answer the question that is there. You'll do that for each person. So you'll rotate around until everybody's shared. And then as a group, you will cooperatively complete questions five through 10 of the Empower quiz. Um, you can come up with answers together, obviously, but make sure you're writing your answer in your own words. You may use your book during this time, but keep in mind, you only have 10 minutes total here. So you don't want to spend too much time digging in the book. Trust your gut, go with answers because you know them to be true. And then when we come back together, we will converse and share out some of our confusions and comprehensions. Um, the last three questions of the quiz you will complete on your own once we finish up in class here today. All right, do we have any questions about how we're gonna move forward? Give me a thumbs up or a I'm good or say yo, yo, I'm set something so I know that everybody's solid. Sweet, sweet. 
Thank you to those folks who have, appreciate you. All right, so I'm gonna set up breakout rooms. Yo, yo, I'm set. Thanks, Robert. That might've been my favorite one. Um, there's going to be three people in each room, uh, three to four. So some of you will have four, some of you will have three. Um, make sure to keep track of your time. I'll give you a halfway warning and a one minute warning. I'll probably pop in and say hi too. Um, awesome, thank you, Benjamin. That might be my second favorite one. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna open the rooms. Please join the room when the little box pops up on your screen. Goodness.
wait for everybody else to come back here. Got about <clears throat> 10 more people, I think. Okay, I think we're all back. Sweet, okay, so let's talk out first any confusions um, that remain in your group conversations. Uh, were there any areas that um, you were still not able to make sense of as a group that I can help answer and clarify? You can type in the chat or I'd prefer you to speak up, but your choice. Miss, for number five, do you want us to like just name a behavior or do we have to like pull it from the book? Um, you can just name a behavior, but the easy way maybe would be to pull it from the book. Like what's something that the house is doing that's spiteful. Okay. Uh, but it could just be anything that's spiteful. That question is more just testing your knowledge of the word than necessarily mm -hmm. the text. Okay, just making sure. Yep. I don't know specifically like what you meant. Yeah, no, great question. Cool. Any other quiz questions or questions about the text? Are we clear on who's who, on which kids are whose kids, how everyone is connected? No questions at all? Okay, the baby sucks question was clear for you guys. I think it's question number six. So question 10, Kenny, you're feeling stuck on? Okay, so for question 10, you're gonna have to make an inference. There isn't a direct right answer. You haven't necessarily been given this answer yet. So. For question 10, your goal is to consider what is the most plausible answer to that question. So consider in this moment that Denver is outside of the house in her little bower, which is like this like um, uh, foliage and green like overhang where you can kind of like hide in there. It's like her little hiding spot. And she's been spending a lot of time outdoors and getting closer to the environment and to nature. And um, she's standing outside looking in the window of the house and she sees into Setha's room and standing there next to Setha is a, is a figure um, in a white dress with her hand around Setha's waist. Who do you think that white figure is? Right? And you're gonna have to make some, just some inferences, some guesses. So it's okay to be wrong on that question. It's okay to be wrong sometimes, but make a guess. All right, any other questions there? Okay. I do want to maybe quickly cover, because this came up in the last class, the difference between the sets of kids, because it can be a bit confusing. So we have Setha, right? She was married to Halle. Um, they had kids together. They had Denver, Howard, Buglar, and then Beloved. Okay. And then there's other kids that are mentioned and talked about. And these are baby Sugg's kids. Baby Sugg is Halle's mom. So baby Sugg is Setha's mother-in-law okay so baby Suggs had six kids of her own one of which is Halle who is the husband and father of Setha's children okay um the other kids that she had and this was in your question so I'll just give it up um they all ended up being traded or sold at some point in their young life so the only child that baby Suggs was able to keep and have a relationship with throughout life was Halle. The rest of her kids were taken from her and sold off or traded off to other farms and, and other owners. This was a very common um, to do in the slave trade. So it was, it, was, it was not unheard of to hear about slaves having babies and then like not ever getting to see them again or them eventually being traded off to somewhere else. 
Um, question seven, what has gone awry at one, two, four? So uh, Stephanie, you've got to first know what the word awry means and you've got to know what one, two, four is. Anything that has gone awry at one, two, four could be a plausible answer for question number seven. I'm not going to give you any more than that because that's what I'm testing is your knowledge of the word awry and your knowledge of what one, two, four references within the book. All right, we've only got about three, is it three minutes left? What time is this class done? Let's see here. Yeah, we've got three minutes left. Are there any remaining questions, concerns, clarifications I can make about the quiz or about the book? So uh, when it says for the vocabulary on question, 12, do they need to be in the same paragraph or like what defines as a scene? So you're not looking for the words in the text. You're going to pick a moment in this in the text and discuss its significance. And in your response, which might be a paragraph, might be longer than that, that's up to you. You need to try to use at least two of those words correctly. Okay. Make sense? Okay. Yes. So for questions 11 through 13, you'll do those on your own. You do not have to submit this today. You can finish 11 through 13 on Thursday and submit it then if you would like, no problem. Um, you are to continue to keep reading. We will come back to the stuff you watched last class next uh, time we have like a discussion. Um, so hold on to those ideas. We will come back to this stuff and this interview with Toni Morrison. But right now it's really important that your comprehension is clear because you're not gonna get some of the bigger ideas if you're not making sense of what's happening when. Um, make sure that you're still annotating. You have to be annotating to be able to draw things out. So look for interesting or repetitive or significant symbols, motifs, themes, tones, um, details about setting, characters, conflict, use of language, any literary techniques, metaphors, comparisons that she might bring up. These are moments that you could zoom in on and you should mark in some way, shape, or form. This text can be really confusing sometimes. So be okay with feeling lost and uncomfortable. Just read through it. You can always reread a scene. You can always come back to a paragraph, um, but don't let one page ruin your chances of reading on. It's okay to feel stuck for a minute. Just keep going and we can come back to those moments and make sense of them, okay? Your goal is to read through chapter six by Thursday, Friday. You will have a quiz on a new set of words and six um, and chapters four through six next week following week, you'll get your new word list uh, next class. We will not have a Zoom on Thursday, Friday. There will be a video posted to Google Classroom. You will complete work on Empower for your attendance on Thursday, Friday. And then hopefully I'll see you on Monday back in person at Westy. Um, time is up. So if you would like to go, you're welcome to. If you have any questions, let me know and I will answer them as you take off. Please say goodbye if you are leaving. Have a lovely day and I'll see you soon. Kenny, chapter six is page, the end of chapter six in the book is page 63. Um, on the digital version, I'm not sure. So you're just going to have to like, you know, go to the beginning and count down to six. I'll make sure I'll get this, I get those page numbers clear for everybody from now on so that you don't have to hunt and find. Okay. Bye, Oliver. Have a good day. Bye, Erin. See ya. Good to see everybody, or at least your names. Bye, Miss. Bye. Bye, Miss. Bye. Bye, Miss Cole. Have a good day. You too. You good, Jackie? You good, Kenny? Miss Kelly, I can't find my score on my IA in Empower. Like, where is it at? Um, yours might not be in yet. Let me check, Jackie. Oh, yeah, there's like six. Oh, same question. I still need to do. Let me see. I'm just trying to catch up. Garrett, I'll put yours in today. Yours isn't in yet. And then Jackie, I'll awesome. put yours cool. in today. Yours isn't oh, okay. in yet either. Thank you. Kenny, is that your question? Oh, uh, no. Okay. Um, no, I don't really have a question. I was thinking like what page it was. That's it. Okay. Yeah, so you're past page 64? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, and you can just keep reading the book. If you're enjoying it, don't feel like you have to slow down.
Okay. Go for I was it. just checking because, like, I was confused, like, because when we took the quiz, some of it was far ahead. I'm just like, wait. <laughs> wait, I know all this already. Yeah. Yeah, you're great. The all last right. question on the quiz is, if you've read ahead, then who comes back to one, two, four? And mm. you know that answer. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you're good. All right. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Have a good one. I'm just